Well, by the same token, you don't have to force yourself or motivate yourself to think negatively, to be depressed, to hate somebody, to want revenge, to want to get back at somebody, to beat yourself up over the head, to feel loaded with guilt. You don't have to make any effort to do that. Your mind is on automatic. It will do that by itself. But if you want to begin to move into your own personal greatness, if you want to begin to really enjoy a happy, successful, healthy life, you've got to be willing to go against the tide. You've got to be willing to harness your will and say, in spite of this, I'm in control here. I'm not going to let this get me down. I'm not going to let this destroy me. I'm coming back and I'll be stronger and better because of it. You have got to make a declaration that this is what you stand for. You're standing up for your dreams. You're standing up for peace of mind. You're standing up for health. You want it and you're going to go all out to have it. It's not going to be easy when you want to change. It's not easy. If, if it were in fact easy, everybody would do it. But if you're serious, you'll go all out to yes. I'm going to turn this situation around. I'm not going to sit back and, and moan and cry over what happened and what went wrong and who did what. I'm going to do something about this situation. The next thing that is important is that expect things to get better for you because they are. See, life is cyclic. You're not, what is, whatever experience you're having right now, it has not come to stay. It has come to pass. Not to stay, just to pass. It's just going through. The biggest challenge is, is to know what's happening. This is a part of this thing we call life. This too shall pass. And maintaining perspective, putting it in perspective. Discipline is like a set of magic keys that unlocks all the doors of wealth, happiness, sophistication, culture, high self-esteem, pride, joy, accomplishment, satisfaction, and success. The first key to discipline is awareness of the need for and the value of discipline, and especially the discipline to make the changes. What will it take? What must I do? And what must I become to get all I want from my life? The second key is the willingness. More than that, the eagerness to maintain your new discipline deliberately, wisely, consistently. And the third key to discipline is the commitment to master the circumstances of your daily life, to see and harness the opportunities to make something of the sun and and the rain, the good as well as what comes in the guise of misfortune. Discipline does many things, but most important of all is what it does for you. It makes you feel better about yourself. Even the smallest discipline can have an incredible effect on your attitude. And the good feeling you get, that surging feeling of self-worth that comes from starting a new discipline, is almost as good as the feeling that comes from the accomplishment of the discipline. Second, a new discipline immediately alters your life direction. You don't change destinations immediately. That is yet to come, but you can change direction immediately, and direction is very important. Third, discipline cooperates with nature. Everything strives. It is a common life function. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it can. Everything strives to become all it can possibly be, and that striving to become is what discipline is all about. Disciplining ourselves to fulfill our natural potential to become all that we can be. And finally, discipline attracts opportunity. Opportunity is always looking for ambition and and skill in action. Discipline taps the unlimited power of commitment. The human will in action, driven by inspiration, enticed by desire, tempered by reason, guided by intelligence, can bring you to that high and lofty place called the good life. Most people can't tolerate the deep face. Let me tell you, my God in heaven, my God in heaven, let me tell you what he did. He repurposed my entire mess and built me a masterpiece. It protects the house. When there's a flood, that house doesn't get hit. It's got a bazillion goddamn rocks all over the place. And then the foundation foundations that those stones are that the entire house is protected that way and then we took the dadgum water and we diverted it into the most incredible waterfall ask ryan stuman you've ever seen in your life there's a waterfall that runs from 100 yards up my hill all the way down cascading into the lake those rocks literally diverted the water that was coming from my family down into the lake it repurposed my mess into building my dream let me remind you of something. Your mess right now in your life, if you got one going, does not disqualify you from making your dream happen. Everyone around you at some point is going to think you're crazy. There's going to be a point where your life was jackhammered and dynamited into a complete mess. And I'm telling you, from those greatest adversities, this is not rah-rah, I'm living proof of it, became one of my great dreams. And from that home is where I met all my mentors, have done the majority of my business deals. My net worth since I built that house has increased about $300 million from that mess, right? I tell you that 
I tell you that because that's going to happen for you. You got to be able to bend time. Man, I, do you hear me on this? There's a few things I know in my life, and I know what I'm telling you is right. Now, you better be able to do all the things you don't want to do as long as you can, so you can do all the things you want to do. You got to do all the things you don't want to do as fast as you can, so you can do all the things you want to do for as long as you can. Because you got eight years left. Time's clicking. My life changed on time when I was 30 years old. My, I went to my, do you have anybody in your family that you resemble? You have like somebody, you look like your uncle or your auntie. Do you have anybody like that? Yes or no, some of you? Mine was my Uncle Mike. It's my godfather. I'm Italian. That's kind of a big deal. It's my dad's only brother. He passed away walking through the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in the lobby at 50 years old of a massive heart attack. I went back to his funeral, and when I went back to his funeral, um, on the way back, the Oprah Winfrey show was on TV. I'm going to give you a tip right now. There's a thing in your brain, I write about it in my book, called the Reticular Activating System. It's called the RAS. It's the part of your brain that keeps you sane so that you don't notice all the stimulus in your life. It filters into you that which you're deeply convicted of or which is important to you. You will literally see, hear, and feel things that you would not otherwise see when something is very important to you. Let me prove it to you. Um, you ever walk into a crowded room and you're looking for a particular person in that room? The rest of the room begins to blur out as you're looking for that. And when we left that room, if I said you were looking for Sarah, there were 40 people in there. When you leave, I said, who were the other 25 people in that room? You have no cognition whatsoever who the other people were in the room because what was important to you was Sarah. How many have ever bought a new car before? You bought a red Acura. All of a sudden, you got that red Acura. Isn't it interesting? You see red Acuras all over the damn road. Same lane, three lanes over, going the wrong direction. You're like, man, everyone's got damn red Acuras. No, they were always there, but they were filtered out because they were not in your importance. If you're going to win, hear all this crap about the secret. There's some validity to it, but here's the truth. There's a reason in your brain that this is all true. It's called the reticular activating system. And if you learn to get super obsessed, your obsessions become your possessions. That's not a meme. That is a fact. When you begin to repeat a thought and a vision to yourself over and over and over again, like that house, over and over and over and over again, like the sale, like the best deal, like the steal on the street, like the investor you need to find, like the buyer you need to find, your RAS filters out like the matrix and begins to find your red Acura for you. And if you don't begin to learn to control that, you lose against someone like me who understands it. Because out of every tragedy, out of every pain, it only gets healed when we find a deeper meaning, when we find there's a higher purpose in it. And I realized I wouldn't have been there that day. I wouldn't have that hunger to help somebody else if that's, I hadn't had the hunger in my own soul at one point missing. So it's very personal to me. I want to thank all of you that made the contributions. And I told Mark and I announced that I'm going to match the million meals if you get it. And I'm sure as hell expecting that you will. People who say money doesn't matter, they don't know where to shop. Because there's some experiences you can buy that are extraordinary. Who's got some experiences, some trips, some things you've done with family or friends that will live with you for years? Who knows what I'm talking about here, right? Those things, that money can be a really valuable tool there. If you can find enough value and have money and do those experiences, how cool. I'll tell you what else money research shows will do. People always say money doesn't matter once you get to a certain level. No, it matters. You can spend $5 a month and have more emotional juice, and it can be measured all the way down by, into your saliva by hormonal changes. You want to use money, not let money use you. But, but here's the problem. I, I used to be a, a head chef in a smorgasbord when I was much younger and, and, and used to cook. And, and working in a restaurant is an interesting thing because the church, in essence, is a restaurant. It is a restaurant. And let me tell you something. When you go to a restaurant, we choose restaurants, yes, because the food is good, but half of the reason we pick the restaurant is because of the ambiance, the atmosphere, whether it be a casual atmosphere that you really, really enjoy, or I tend to like pristine uh, atmospheres with white table cloths and elegance and excellence and crystal and china and all the stuff I didn't get growing up, I'm still restoring that to the canker worms and glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm still eating steaks today because when my father ate steaks, we ate hamburger with gravy on it. And I'm still getting even. I just eat a steak and say, see, I'm grown. That's how I got this big being grown. Bless God. But the church is a lot like a restaurant. When you go to a restaurant, everything out front is real nice and the music is playing and the violin and so the singer is singing over in the corner and you got the white tablecloth and you got the crystal goblets and the china and everybody's putting their, putting their, isn't that something about the putting a napkin in your lap? That's when you know you really have arrived. When the service is so good that somebody just comes up and just puts a napkin all in your lap. First time they did that, I thought they was getting fresh, you know, I thought, nah, of course I've been on the road a while, you know, but, uh, uh, Anyway, let me get past that. And so you, you, you're having this, maybe I should have stopped it tonight. I don't want to mess you up. But you have this great experience in the restaurant, but that's not how it is in the kitchen. 
in the kitchen you got uh, leftover lettuce heads over in the corner that you got to throw away and you got stuff bubbling and boiling and cooking and spilling over and people are yelling at one another I said bring the soup it's behind we got to get out front of this it's, it's not like that in the kitchen in the kitchen all the hell is breaking loose doubtless you can't have no doubt you can't have no doubts I'm not talking about other people believing for you you got to believe this for yourself being successful is not a magic trick you just have to learn the principles of success I am telling you your education ain't got nothing to do with it it's your dreams and visions a man without a dream or vision should perish. Now, when you gonna ask him for it, and are you gonna wait for it to happen? Or are you gonna lose faith? Well, I guess it wasn't the Lord's will. Who are you? How you know what God's will is? It all happens at an appointed time, but you have to stay in faith for the appointed time to happen for you. You've got to sell yourself every day on your abilities, on the goal that you want to reach. You can learn all the techniques in the world. If you don't believe in yourself, it won't happen for you. And as you convince you, as you sell yourself, every day you will begin to see a difference in the things that you're doing. Telling yourself every day, here I go again, and I got what it takes. This is my day, and nothing out here is going to stop me. It's possible to finish something before you start. In fact, it would be a bit foolish to start until you had it finished. So human beings have this remarkable ability to finish something and then start. We've heard the old expression, don't count your chickens until they're hatched. Say, no, we have the ability to count our chickens long before they're hatched. Because we know, we have faith, we believe. We use the law of averages. There's, there's bound to be at least so many out of every dozen, out of every hundred, out of every fifty. So it's possible to see the end, then begin. Start looking into the future of what you would like to accomplish, where you would like to go, the person you would like to be, and see if you can't get a better picture of the finished objective. See yourself there, see yourself in possession of. I was in business with Bob Cummings, the old movie star for a while. He said, decide what you want and then act as if you already had it. And being an actor, he could give us a few tips on acting. Decide what you want and act as if it was already yours. Now, the reason we can act thinking that it's already ours is because not only can we vision the end results, we can also vision the beginning of making it real. So we don't start till it's finished, but it is possible for human beings to finish something before they start. Human beings are the only life on earth that has this incredible capacity to change the course of your life. No other life form can do that. Every other life form except human seems to operate simply by instinct and the genetic code. In the winter, the goose flies south. How often? Answer, every winter. If you said to the goose, hey, it'd be better this year to go west, he ignores that advice. And the reason is because he cannot make choices and listen to advice of something that might be better. He has to obey instinct and the genetic code. But now jot this down, not human beings. Human beings can alter the course of their life. Human beings can live one way for five years, tear up that script, live a totally different way the next five years. The first six years of my economic life, I wound up broke. The second six years, I wound up rich. Someone says, how did you do that? Here's number one, I discovered I was not a goose. Someone says, don't you have to do the second six years like you did the first six years and jot this down? No, no, you don't have to live the second six years like the first six. You can use all the information and all the advice and 
repairing all of your mistakes and adopting a new and refined philosophy so that the next six years can be totally different than the last six. Are you letting your circumstances talk you out of what God put in your heart? Now you've quit believing. God still wants to bring it to pass, but you have to get in agreement with Him and say, God, I still believe it can happen. The odds are against me, but I still believe I can accomplish my dream. I was raised in dysfunction, but I still believe I can set a new standard. Thoughts whispering, you'll never beat the right person. You can't pass that college course. If you start dwelling on it, these problems are so big. I don't see how it can work out. Before long, you'll be negative. Don't take the bait. Those are lies to try to defraud you out of your purpose. Do yourself a favor, ignore it. Just say, no thanks, I still believe. Faith is the belief in things that you cannot see. You can never lose faith. When you don't see no way how, you have to buckle down and keep believing. God is always coming. No other life form can do this. See, if you were a tree, you'd be stuck. As a tree, if you used up all the nourishment that was around you and you couldn't change location, see, you would die. But that's not true. Human beings can change location, go north, south, east, west, live here for a while, live somewhere else for a while. So that's a note to make. You can greatly alter the course of your life. Now here's the next note to make. Five years from now, you will arrive. The question is where? This is for mature people now. If you keep up your present disciplines and keep up the present pace that you're on, where will you be in five years? Boy, it's easy to say, hey, I haven't really thought about that. So now make this note. In five years, here's the probability. You will either arrive at a well-designed destination or an undesigned destination. Well-designed or undesigned. And I promise you, five years from now, you, you really don't want to arrive at an undesigned destination. Because you may very well wind up wearing what you don't want to wear, driving what you don't want to drive, living where you don't want to live, maybe doing what you don't want to do. Simply because you didn't design a better destination. Key phrase, up front, the decisions are easy. Sometimes after we've lived a few years now to repair our mistakes and get back on track, seems like a tough job. If you've messed up your health for 10 years, I'm telling you, it takes more than 10 days to get it back. But here's the key, and it's so exciting to talk to the teenagers. Make the note, if you start early, the fortune belongs to you. If you start early, all fortunes that are available to humans, if you start early, the promise looms large and the odds are heavy in your favor. Now, yes, it's possible to do some radical things starting late and still arrive with some good treasures and some good things. But when you haven't got that much time left, now sometimes the decision has to be so drastic people are not willing to make it and they're too tired and too weary and too ill and say, look, I don't have much time left. It's not going to happen for me anyway. It's easy to take that attitude. But everyone here, we've got the time over the next 10 years. We've got the time the next 20 years. We've got the time the next 30 years to make some repair now in our errors of the past and set up some new disciplines. And I'm telling you, that's going to change everything. So five years from now, I wish for you to arrive at a well-designed place, a place of productivity, a place that'll make you feel good about yourself, a place that'll give you honor and respect, a place that'll give you influence to touch other people five years from now that you couldn't do today. Where will you be in five years? Key phrase, we go the direction we face. We go the direction we face. If you start designing something at the end of this direction, sure enough, you will start going the direction you face and we face the direction we design. Don't get talked out of what you're believing for. You had every right to give up. The setback should have talked you out of it. 
You haven't seen any sign of things changing. All the facts say it's impossible. Your attitude is, that's okay. God can do the impossible. Don't get talked out of your dreams. The disappointment is not going to cause you to get discouraged. The people who don't believe in you is not going to dampen your faith. The environment you were raised in is not going to stop your destiny. Your time is coming. What God put in your heart is still on the way. Guess how quickly you can change your health by starting to eat an apple a day. Mama said an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Let's say you've been ill long enough. And you've had health problems long enough and you say, that's it. That's over. I'm going to now start a program. You don't have to really revolutionize your whole health life. Just start with an apple a day. You say, well, is it that simple to change your health life? And the answer is yes. The key is just to start. You know, you pick up a book on good health and you get halfway through the book and it says, now, dear reader, set this book aside, fall down on the floor and see how many push-ups you can do. And then it goes on to say, and if you have not done that, why not give this book away? It looks like you're not going to do it. Come on, you don't have to radically do something. You can gain momentum and make changes as you go. Just start. Here's what happens when you start a new direction. Self-esteem starts to accelerate. It doesn't take much for you to feel good about yourself. Just commit it to a new direction and you feel good. And an apple a day committed to finally having a health program that'll make you the healthiest you've ever been in the next 20 years. All you got to do is munch on that first apple and nobody even has to be around you and you don't have to announce it to the world. But you munch on that first apple and say, this is the beginning of developing a health program that's going to make me so healthy I'll have the vitality to do whatever I want to do for the next 30 years of my life. Munch, munch, happy, happy, self-esteem off the scale. Now, if you eat an apple the second day, you become almost delirious. Saying, wow, I'm on my way. Somebody said, just two apples? Says, look, you don't understand. Not only did I do it yesterday, I've done it again today. This is really proving to myself with no audience, no microphones, no nothing, just you and yourself. You've convinced yourself, I'm on my way to the healthiest I ever have been. I'm starting a new life. This is the second day I'm on my way. That's how easy it is to change your life. You don't need some dramatic vision. Just begin something. And maybe by health or by whatever other things we can think of to do, you just get back on a better track. Okay? It's a small journey to changing direction. We find ourselves when we discover our purpose. Nothing is better than for a person with a plan for his or her life to find themselves, find that purpose. It does not matter where you sit. It does not matter what you have, Lord. But if you don't have purpose in your bowels, you cannot do what God has called you to do. It's what makes you solid. It's what makes you secure. It's, it's your mooring. It keeps you just exactly where you need to be so that you can accomplish what you want to accomplish. To discover your purpose, to find yourself. What a wonderful thing. That's what our subject is about today. But if you don't have the tough tenacity, God-anointed, purpose-driven life, you will give up and walk away. But there are some of us that have nothing to walk away to. If it's fight, we just got to fight. We're like the woman with the issue of blood. If I have to crawl to get there, then I'm getting on my knees. I still got to go. But there's a second challenge. Once we find our purpose, discover why we're here, there's a second challenge that we have that we face, and that is to lose ourselves. And, and we lose ourselves when our purpose becomes bigger than us. It, to find a purpose, how important. But then to take that purpose and place it in a position with people that has eternal factors involved is to lose yourself and to go to another whole level of life and another level of living. Very few people find themselves and lose themselves. Place that purpose in a position that is so much bigger than us that we can literally lose ourselves in the process. 
in a time of change that's taking place around the world, in a time when people are feeling a great deal of anxiety and fear and reservations about the future, at a time when people are going to work and don't know whether or not they will have a job when they get off, and not necessarily because of their performance, but because of what's happening in the economy, at a time when there are challenges more so than ever before in personal relationships, that many times I'm sure that we've all taken time just to stop and reflect many times when we hear what's happening in the news or read the newspapers. And so I think that now more than ever, we must begin to look at what are the things that we can do will enable us to do some things and use some powers that we have that many of us go through life never ever discovering that we have those things going for us. And part of that, I believe, is knowing what it is your life worth. What is it that gives your life a sense of meaning and purpose? Because once you find that, it puts you in your power place. See, if you know what your life work is, I encourage you to start working on it. If you can't do it all at one time, do just a little bit of it. And if you don't know what it is that you showed up to do, if you don't know why you're here, I encourage you to find out what your purpose is here. What is the meaning of your life? Once you identify it, you have to invest in it. You have to support it. You have to put yourself in an environment where you can shine. So the first question we have to ask ourselves this morning is how do we find ourselves? That's challenge number one. And we find ourselves by when we discover our purpose. The world is such, so full of apathy. It's so full of average. A person with passion always stands out. It sets us apart. It sets us above the crowd. So once you have passion and once you have a, a sense of energy in your life, it just sets you apart. It distinguishes you. It already gives you what I would call a head start in success in life. There are way more followers in the world than there are leaders. Never assume people think of you the way you think of yourself. What perceptions are you creating? If you're going to put these negative perceptions out there about yourself, at least be conscious of them. So I'm saying that we have to work through the challenges of life in learning how to begin to work to fortify ourselves. I can live my dream. I can find my purpose in life. I deserve more for myself. Just start working at it just a little bit, but do find out what your work is and hold on to it and don't let your dream go. Don't let it go. Why is it that most people don't pursue their dreams or don't do better than what they're doing if they're capable of doing it? I think that many of us don't go the next step because we don't know what to do yet. And I say that, that the reason that we don't even explore the possibility of what to do is because subconsciously we don't believe that it can happen for us. We don't believe that we deserve it. So let's talk about it. Never assume people think of you the way you think of yourself. Once you decide to put these perceptions out there in the universe, if you're not content with the way most of the people think of you, now you're on a mission to change those perceptions. When you change those perceptions, people are going to either decide to roll with you or not. You have been blessed with so many gifts and talents, natural gifts, that if you unleash everything that you're capable of doing on the world at one time, it's going to be overwhelming. It's going to be too much. You are a gift from God. You have so many talents. If you drop too much on people at one time, it's going to be overwhelming. There are going to be plenty of times in your life when you're not happy. There might be years. And so it's a shallow boat in a very rough ocean. Happiness is something that descends upon you. Everyone knows that. It comes upon you suddenly. And then you should be grateful for it because there's plenty of suffering. And if you happen to be happy, wonderful. Enjoy it. Be grateful for it. And maybe try to meditate on the reasons that it manifested itself because it, it can come as a mystery you know you, you don't necessarily know when you're going to be happy something surprising happens and delights you and you can analyze that you can think well i'm doing something right i'm in the right place right now i've done something right maybe i can hang on to that maybe i can learn from that what you should be pursuing instead is you should be pursuing who you could be that'd be the first thing it's like, because you're not who you could be, and you know it. You have guilt and shame and, and regret. 
you berate yourself for your lack of discipline and your procrastination and all your bad habits, you know perfectly well that you're not who you could be. And God only knows who you could be. And so that's how you should be strive that's what you should be striving for. And associated with that, you should be attempting to formulate some conception of the highest good that you can conceive of, that you can articulate. Because why not aim for that? Your life is short and it's troublesome. And perhaps you need to do something worthwhile with it. And if so, then you should do the most worthwhile thing. Figure out what that is for you and to dispense with those parts of you that are unworthy. And then maybe, if you're fortunate and you do that carefully, then happiness will descend upon you from time to time. And that's the best you've got. And then also perhaps during sorrowful times, the fact that you've strengthened your character and that you're aiming at the highest that you can conceptualize, that'll give you the moral fortitude to endure without becoming corrupted during those times. So here's what I'm suggesting. How much time do you spend working on you? How much time do you spend every day working on your dream? In the last 90 days, how many books have you read? In the last year, what new skill or knowledge have you acquired? What kind of investment have you made in you? I'm saying that as you begin to look at where you want to go, if you want to make it today, and things are changing so fast you have to literally run to stand still, I'm saying that you've got to make some conscious effort to begin to work to develop you. Dream, and I'm here to tell you there are a whole bunch of you out there. You're adding value to the dream of somebody that you're working with. You're making a difference. So your purpose may not be just for personal use. It may be for corporate use or collective use. It may be bigger than you. Does that make sense? Passion. But the second question we ask ourselves is not only what am I passionate about, but what are my strengths? What am I good at? What is my spiritual giftedness? Because when God created you, he gave you gifts spiritual strengths to enable you to find and fulfill your purpose. Disciplines undone in the future give us poor results. Discipline managed well gives us good results. We're affected by our dreams, our vision of the future. You want to make sure that the greatest pull on your life is the pull of the future. Some people live in the past and let their life be continually pulled and influenced by the past. And yes, we must remember the past and review the past to make it useful to invest in the future. Make sure that the greatest pull on your life is the pull of the future. If you're skimpy on your dreams, that isn't very well planned, then it doesn't pull very hard. Then you have more of a tendency to be pulled by the past or to be pulled apart by events or circumstances. So in order to save yourself from being pulled apart by distractions or pulled back to the past, you want to now start really designing the future so that the greatest part of your attention and pull, like a magnet, pulls you forward into the future to accomplish your goals. Goals are like a magnet. They pull, and the stronger they are, and the more purposeful they are, the bigger they are, the stronger they pull. If you have excellent goals, here's what they also do. They pull you through, pull you through all kinds of down days, down seasons. They pull you through distraction on every side that says, look here, look here, look here. Strong, powerful dreams like a magnet pull you through that. Some people get swallowed by the disaster because they have nothing on the other side of the disaster to pull them through. At the other side of the difficult time, at the other side of the down time, if you've got plenty out there to attract and pull, it'll pull you through all these things. And very little of it will attach itself to you. You'll be able to get through some of the most difficult times if you have this spectacular vision ahead of you of where you're going and what you're going to accomplish. Getting through will be easy. You can get discouraged a lot of ways, but the one surefire way to avoid discouragement, first of all, let's understand something. We're all participating in this thing called life. All of us. Life has ebb and flows. Mountain tops, it's got valleys. It's got thunderstorms in it, earthquakes. This life, stop expecting it to go smooth. Because it ain't finna go smooth. The road to success is always under construction. This life ain't set up to be smooth. You combat negativity and you combat discouragement with gratitude. It's the one way to combat discouragement is with gratitude. What messes you up is you focus on the thing that's not happening. And that causes you to get discouraged. 
So whenever you get discouraged, you have to change your focus from what's not happening to what has happened. And it straightens you out immediately. Because what causes the, the, the downslide is if you get wrapped up in the what ain't happening, it get ugly, man. And it just snowballs. But you have to focus on gratitude. People understand how serious gratitude is. You know, it's, it's a serious principle of success. It's hard to be miserable and grateful at the same time. Joy and depression cannot reside in the same space. So when you get down and you start thinking about how dark it is, I want you to remember everything your mother taught you that was good. And that replaced all the negative thoughts I was having. Because joy and depression cannot reside in the same space. Well now, you got to take that concept and apply it to your life. If joy and depression cannot reside in the same place, when you get depressed and you get discouraged, you got to replace it with joy. And what more joyous than gratitude? What has God done for you? Didn't you wake up today? Ain't you still breathing? Don't you have some measure of health? Ain't you working? You may not have the car you want, but don't you have a car? Ain't you eating groceries today? You ain't homeless? Now when you start tripping and you get depressed, you gotta go into yourself and come up with some gratitude. Once you get grateful, you can't be discouraged and grateful at the same time. You cannot do it. That's how you come back every single time. It happened to me the other day. I woke up, I just wasn't on the right side of the bed. Went downstairs to start doing my meditation. I pull out a list of everything I'm grateful for. By the time I got to 13, I was fine. Because guess what? I'm alive, I'm breathing, I'm healthy. My grandkids is healthy, my children is healthy. That's how you do it. That's how you come back. I'm telling you, it works. It works. Just, just try it. Reasons come first, answers come second. If you get a compelling vision and you got strong enough reasons that will push you through the tough times, you're going to do things other people don't do instead of collapsing. Even if you get off target, you won't go, oh, I blew it. You'll get right back on target, make the change, make things happen. First step, vision that's compelling. Second step, make sure that there's strong enough reasons to follow through. Third step, you got to review it and feel it every day. I mean, anything. Have you ever had this happen in your life? Has there been anything in your life that you've ever wanted so badly? You were so desirous of it. You had such a hunger for it that you couldn't stop thinking about it. Could have been a career move. Could have been when you're a kid, a, a car. It could have been a relationship. It could have been anything, but you were obsessed. You wanted to make this happen. You wanted to attract this to your life. You want to, you just wanted something and you didn't even know how to get it. But it was so compelling to you. you. Kept thinking about it every day, envisioning it, imagining it, feeling it, and then stuff happened, and suddenly you started to attract people or situations to your life, and it just came together. Like you didn't even have a total plan. It was just that it was so a part of your focus, with so much intensity and emotion, so often that it sensitized you to notice anything that could get you there. There's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system. For short, we call it the RAS. That part of your brain determines what you notice in the world. And it's really important because when you set a goal, when you get really clear on a vision, and there's strong enough reasons, and you review it enough, and it becomes a part of you, that part of your brain says, anything that relates to this, I need to notice. It's like, did you ever buy a certain kind of car or maybe a, a certain outfit, and suddenly you see that car everywhere, those outfits everywhere? Well, you know, the cars were always around, but why do you see it now? because your RAS knows this is important. This is part of my world now. Similarly, when you really get clear and it's compelling and you're reviewing it every day, got strong reasons and you're reviewing it every day and you're feeling it, the brain becomes incredibly acute at noticing anything to get you to move forward. And so that's the power of it. All right, sit up in your chair with some emo energy then, put yourself in a peak state, and let's take a look at what nine of these emotions or eight or seven or whatever I put up here are. Number one, fear. So if you're feeling fear, what does that mean usually? What's the message? The message always is that you need to change something. Is that true? Yes or no? So every negative emotion means I've got to what? I've got to what? Change something. Either my perception or what I'm doing. Fear means that you've got to prepare for something. You're afraid because your brain's saying message is prepare. Change what you're doing and get more prepared. 
prepare for something that's going to happen so you're better prepared for it physically. Now, sometimes we just indulge in the emotion and we stay in the fear and we really are prepared. For example, let's say you're going to get up to speak in front of a group and you're prepared, but you still have fear. It's because you got the message, you did the work, but you didn't shut the emotion off and say, you know, I am prepared. No reason to be afraid anymore. I'm ready. I'm ready. You never told your brain, it's okay, you don't have to give me a message anymore, I've done my work. Okay? So it's saying you need to prepare for something. Maybe it's a physical challenge. Maybe it's preparing for some loss that may be coming up. Something's about to come up, you need to be prepared for it. Okay, just get prepared. But once you get prepared, get off it. Let your brain know, okay, I am prepared, move on. Focus on what you want now. What's hurt? Hurt usually is telling you an expectation you have has not been met. It's just telling you, hey, you have this expectation, it's not met. So what should you do when you have an expectation that's not met? You should focus on what you do want now. Write down your notes, focus on what you do want now. Don't keep focusing on why you're disappointed, or how somebody disappointed you, or how you feel so hurt by them. An expectation wasn't met, and you need to change your approach. Focus on it. Or it means you need to change your communication. Hurt means you expected someone to treat you a certain way, and they didn't treat you that way. So you need to change your communication. You need to come to them and say, you know, I need your help. You know, when you communicate that way, in the past, I've interpreted that to mean you didn't care. I know you care, because I know how much you love me, and I love you. You know, could you help me out this way? What does it really mean to you when you do that? And then listen. So, you know, in the future, I really appreciate it if you do it this way instead. Would that work for you? Would you be willing to do that? Okay, great. Fantastic. It's a message that says you've got to communicate your needs better if you're feeling hurt. Hurt means I need to communicate my needs better. Or hurt also means I need to meet someone else's needs. So you feel hurt because you need to meet their needs. That's why they didn't meet yours. Either you're not meeting their needs or you're not communicating how to have your needs be met. Or you have an expectation you need to move on. This is not going to work out. So, focus on what will. Third, anger. Anger is a message that says you have a major rule that's been violated. When you're angry, you have a rule that's been violated. We all have rules about how things must be and how they should be. And boy, some rules, if somebody violates some of our rules, man, we really get angry, don't we? By the way, you may also be angry because you violated your own rules. Is that true? Yeah, you're not doing what you believe you must do, and you get angry with yourself. Sometimes we get angry with ourselves, we spread that out towards somebody else, find somebody to lay blame on. Four, frustration. Frustration is a message that what you're doing isn't working and that you need to what? Change. If you're frustrated, it means you still can succeed, but you gotta change. You're frustrated, says, God, something's here and you know you could succeed and you're frustrated because what you're doing isn't working. Change and you can still get what you want. Flex. Disappointment. Disappointment's a message, again, that you expected something to happen it's not going to. So immediately, focus on what you want now. Focus on what you want now. It's a message that you have to get off it. You need to let go of something and move on and focus on what you want now. Guilt. Guilt is a powerful emotion if it's not abused and overused and indulged in. Any of these emotions are lousy if you indulge in them. Would you agree with me on that? Sit there and indulge in your fear and your hurt and your anger. Indulging means you keep focusing on the feeling instead of getting the message and moving on and learning. Guilt, though, can be valuable. It's telling you you have violated one of your own standards and you need to do something immediately to be certain you won't do this again. You're having that pain of guilt because your brain is saying you just violated one of your most important standards of your life. You violated one of your own values. And you're going to keep getting this pain until you make yourself certain you're not going to do this again. You know what some people do? They just keep going back and feeling guilty about what they did in the past. The message is saying... Get clear you broke your own rules and commit no matter what, you're not going to do it again. Make it clear, be certain you're not going to do it again, and your guilt will go away like that. Because that's the purpose of guilt. Make sure you don't violate your standards and make sure you do it well in the future. Success, by the way, is not some overnight event. It's all these little things. Success is having a vision. Success is making it compelling. Success is really seeing it, feeling it every day with strong enough reasons. Success is feeling the sense that I'm here to grow and I'm here to give something to the world more than just myself. Success is caring about other people. Success is calling and saying I love you in the middle of the day for no damn reason. Or sending a note. That'll change your relationship. Have a ritual of something funny, playful, or a surprise you do. How many relationships are dead today because they have no surprise rituals anymore? You need to have some rituals, some cool things you do that nobody else does that gives you a better life than anybody else has. All the little stuff, that's where success comes from.
And in business, it comes from delivering more than anybody could imagine. All those little things add up, people go, wow, that's who I want to do business with. It's true in any area of your life. So if you look at somebody who's really successful and you think, wow, I mean, they're, they're so amazing. They're such a genius. You got to dig underneath and you got to remember something. People are rewarded in public for what they've practiced for years in private. Myself and my business people say, how do you get up and speak? And you have no notes and you go for three days and nights and the room is like, it's wired and it's incredible. It's like a rock concert. How do you do that? How do you have that confidence? Oh, and you know, it's not confidence, it's experience now. But I did so much behind the scenes and I still do to make things right. I mean, how many people would know that since the time I was 17 years old, before I walk out on stage, still do to this day, wouldn't need to do it, but I still do it. I never walk out there without being in an absolute peak state of mind. You know, there are days my back is hurting, my throat is hurting, or I may have had a challenge, or my father passed away, and I've still got to deliver for these people because my standard is give my all every time. Every event has to be better. Talk to anybody who's been to our events for five, ten years, some of our trainers. I don't know how he does it. He always finds a way to make it better. That's not an ego thing. That's a standard in me. I have to find the way. And my ritual, though, is I prepare. I think. I gather new information. I figure out how to put something across better. What do people need? I spend time with our customers. I see what's going on. And before I get on stage each time, I have this little ritual. You have to want to work. You never get better if you're not willing to put in the time. Most people think, well, I'll be successful if something happens. I'll be successful if I win the lottery ticket. Look, you're not going to be successful if you don't demand it. If you literally don't stake a claim to it, say, this is mine, it's important, you're not going to have it. People, why can't you be satisfied? Why do you always got to get things so perfect? Why do you spend so much time here? When you're obsessed, people think you're nuts. High performers are obsessed about the topic in which they're trying to learn, master, grow into. And if no one thinks you're crazy, you're not yet operating to the outer limits of your potential. You're not there yet. Because somebody in your life should say, you really care about this in a crazy way. And when you get there, you know you found your thing. Most of y'all where y'all are because you never take ownership. It's always somebody else's problem. It's always somebody else's fault why you didn't do what you were supposed to do. It's not their fault. Take ownership. Take the parts that belong to you. Why? Because I'm the one that's messing up opportunities. I'm the one that keeps repeating my past. And you need to free yourself up and start doing something new. But you can't do new until you get rid of that old. Now we've got it down to five and two. And maybe that's not too dangerous. I don't know. If God would have thought of five and two, he might have made it five and two. I don't know. You can't think of everything. But here's what it does mean. Enterprise is better than ease. If you rest too long, the jungle overtakes the village. Now here's the good news about the war between good and evil. Evil is no match for good, but good must be active. Weeds are no match for human activity, but if you stand still, how far in will they come? All the way. They'll grow right up around your shoes. And for many of you, you have robbed yourself of a full life because you don't want to deal with crises, because they're uncomfortable, and because you're timid and passive, you run from them. There's going to be some scars. The scars going to come. You might as well get blessed by the scars. They're going to come. But if you get busy, how far back can you take them? As far as you wish. They're no match, but you must be happy. That's why the six of one. Make sure you're not losing the war by taking off. Too Guess what the average years are after retirement? Six. Six. Which means don't retire. <laughs> Your chances are too slow.